Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm Rhonda Curry, Director of Communications at The Hutch, and on behalf of all of us, I'd like to welcome you tonight. I would like to begin this evening by thanking those of our guests who have been to a Science for Life presentation before. And could I see a show of hands? Oh, this is a loyal crowd. Thank you so much. I'm also going to ask your patience while I give a little bit of information about the Hutch and Science for Life to our new guests. It's been a very exciting year for Seattle. As most people know, our Seahawks are Super Bowl champions this year, world champions. And at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, we are true world champions as well. And we call our Lombardis Nobel Prizes. And we've won three. Our team of world-renowned scientists are seeking new and innovative ways to prevent, diagnose, and treat cancer, HIV, AIDS, and other life-threatening diseases. The Hutch's pioneering work in bone marrow transplantation has led to the development of immunotherapy. It harnesses the power of our own immune system to treat cancer with minimal side effects. We're an independent nonprofit research center based in Seattle right here on this gorgeous campus in South Lake Union. And we house the nation's largest and first cancer research prevention center as well as the clinical coordinating center for the Women's Health Initiative and the international headquarters of the HIV Vaccine Trials Network. Much of our work is funded through grants, but with federal dollars declining, private contributions are essential and critical to expediting important medical research breakthroughs. We're really glad you're here tonight for Science for Life. Our free community event series provides a glimpse into the exciting science conducted here. It breaks down concepts, skips the homework, and offers a chance for you to interact with world-class researchers in what we hope is a fun and informal atmosphere, and we hope you're enjoying your popcorn. <laughs> a couple of details before I introduce tonight's speaker. There will be wireless mics circulating throughout the event, so you'll be able to ask questions. There will also be time at the end of Dr. Stoddard's presentation, a dedicated Q&A time. He's been very generous with being open to having a dialogue as well as a formal Q&A. So please uh, do take this opportunity to get this one-on-one -on -one opportunity to speak with Dr. Stoddard. I would like to ask you something important. Um, you're always reminded to, tell your, to turn your cell phones off, but in this auditorium, because we are recording, could we ask you to please turn them off or put them on airplane mode? Uh, it's not enough just to have a do not disturb or a silent. Thank you so much. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Barry Stoddard. He's a native of the Northwest. He was born in Montana, lived in northern Idaho and Washington State for most of his life. He graduated from high school in 1981. He attended Whitman College. Graduated with a bachelor's degree in chemistry and a minor in biology in 1985. He entered graduate school at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, earning his doctorate in 1990 in biophysical chemistry. Following his postdoctoral work at the University of California in Berkeley, he joined the faculty here at the Hutch in December of 92, where he has supervised a research laboratory ever since. And I'm not sure if he'll have time in his presentation to tell you a little about how he got here and um, his early experiences, but he has been here, as I said, since 1992. And the first time I heard him speak, I was struck by his enthusiasm and his energy on his projects and his work. And when you think about research, and we are in such an instant gratification time. And the work that Dr. Stoddard does is much like a marathon, except that the miles are measured in years. So to have that exuberant energy and enthusiasm really struck me, and I was quite happy when he agreed to be our speaker this evening. He was promoted to full member at the Hutch in 1999, and he's also an affiliate associate professor at the University of Washington School of Medicine in the Department of Biochemistry. He's also a member of two interdisciplinary graduate research programs and a senior investigator in the Northwest Genome Engineering Consortium. Finally, in his spare time, he is the senior executive editor of the journal Nucleic Acids Research. 
He lives in Bellevue with his wife, Amy. His boys, Ben and Zach, are both engineers in training, one in computer science and one in mechanical engineering, respectively. And in his true free time, he enjoys traveling, theater, music, skiing, golfing, diving, biking, and reading. Tonight's presentation is called Getting to the Root of the Problem, Eliminating the Gene Behind Inherited Diseases. We're really fortunate this evening to have Dr. Stoddard present his work and teach us about a new technique known as targeted gene correction. This family of therapies may someday cure challenging and sometimes fatal diseases. Please join me at this time in welcoming Dr. Barry Stoddard. Well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for taking time out of your lives and your schedule um, to come down here and uh, hear about our work and about the Hutchinson Center uh, uh, on a Thursday evening in the middle of the winter. Um, it says a lot about your interest in either the Hutchinson Center or science or medicine or a combination thereof that you would take time and we really, really appreciate it. Um, I'll tell you just a tiny bit more about myself before I get into the science. Um, I don't know if any of you are skiers, but if, if any of you are, have any of you ever been to Schweitzer Ski Area in Sandpoint? I grew up right at the base of that hill. Um, so right when you make the left-hand turn and start up the mountain was where my house was. Um, so I started skiing when I, there when I was about five years old and uh, uh, had a misspent youth uh, hitchhiking up every single day I possibly could. Um, so I'm the rarest of creatures. I'm a, a, a native Northwesterner, born and bred. Uh, except for a little bit of time back east and down in California. I've always lived in the Northwest. Uh, I love it here. I would never want to go anywhere else. Um, and I'm also uh, the answer to a trivia question that I will impart to you. If anybody ever asks you, who was the very first research scientist in residence on this campus here on Lake Union at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, you can tell them it was Dr. Barry Stoddard because I was first. I was here first. Um, the story behind that is that this center in its original incarnation was first opened up on First Hill uh, next to where Swedish Hospital is now. Um, and this campus broke ground and started uh, um, construction uh, uh, in 1990. And the very first wave of people moving into this campus was scheduled for about April of 1993. And I showed up just a few months prior to that, straight from my postdoc in California, and I was bringing with me about uh, close to a million dollars worth of x-ray equipment that was being delivered from the company we had ordered it from, and the Hutch suddenly realized that they didn't want to install all this x-ray equipment up at the old facility and then three months later have to take it all down and move it down here. So they really quickly finished one big room way ahead of schedule, the rest of the building that we're sitting in was completely unfinished. There were carpenters still all over the place, but they finished one room ahead of time and let me move in uh, uh, ahead of everyone else with my x-ray machine. And so I spent the first three months of 1993 uh, in this room putting together an x-ray machine. I had no furniture. I was sitting on a wooden crate that my transformer had been delivered in. I had no telephone, no internet. No one could find me. No one knew where I was. It, it was the best three months of my entire career. No one could, no one could bug me. And, it was, and uh, there were all these carpenters who uh, suddenly re realized that there was this dude who had shown up with this big machine with lights and whistles and bells and everything who looked like he was doing something kind of cool. And so they all showed up and started peeking their heads around the corner. And so I went ahead and brought them in and uh, showed them how it worked. There's a whole bunch of carpenters in Seattle that know a little bit about how to do uh, x-ray crystallography to this day. And again, it was just a wonderful time. Um, so I've been here, I was 29 when I started my faculty position. I'm uh, turning 51 this year. So I've been here a little bit over 20 years. And what I'm going to tell you about today is a story that really spans the majority of the time that I've been here at the Hutchinson Center, um, uh, focused on the area of trying to come up with uh, uh, new ways to treat and hopefully cure uh, peoples who have inherited diseases or genetic diseases. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of introduce you or remind you about some basic biology, DNA, RNA, proteins, sort of set the stage. Um, then we're going to move into sort of like a little bit of the research and walk you through w how we're trying to do what we're doing. We'll come back to biology with respect to a very specific genetic disease and then just try to give you a flavor of how the basic science, which is what I do, 
eventually merged with the clinical end of things, actual doctors, the type of doctors that can actually do you some good. Because I'm a doctor, but as my wife will tell you, oh yeah, he's the type of doctor who really can't do you much good at all. So I'm going to sort of walk you through that story of from bench to bedside. And the one thing I would like to encourage, because this is about a 20 minute talk that we're going to compress into an hour of time. So we have lots of time for questions. So if I say something that you don't fully understand, uh, just shoot, it, shoot your hand up and stop me. Because if you're thinking of it, I guarantee there's 15 other people who are also scratching their heads. So um, I'm encouraging and expecting that you, you'll interrupt me. Put up your hand, um, ask questions. Uh, and with that, let's go ahead and get started. Provided that I can, is this the machine? Yes. So I'm going to start with just one of the very basic aspects of, uh, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I'm really wondering what marketing is hiding behind this curtain. Uh, <laughs> We'll take a look at, at the end of this. Um, <laughs> I think I can see my talk over it. Um, let's start with just the basic aspects of molecular biology. So in every single cell in your body, and you have billions of cells in your bodies, is a set of blueprints in the form of DNA um, that are necessary for the creation of every single molecule and cell and structure that's required for life and is required to make you the wonderful person that you are. So every single uh, cell in your body has a set of these blueprints, and those blueprints have the information necessary to tell some cells to become red blood cells, other cells to become white blood cells, other cells to become skin, to become liver, to become heart, muscle, bone, spleen, appendix, whatever. Um, but the blueprints are identical in each and every cell, but clearly, they are read in different ways by different cells. So the, these blueprints, DNA, of which you have two copies in every single cell in your body, one from your mom and one from your dad, are actually organized very similarly to the way any good novel is organized. Words, sentences, letters, chapters, sections. So um, the, the blueprints of life uh, uh, basically are written in the form of DNA, and as I mentioned, you receive, at the moment of your conception, two sets of those blueprints, one from mom, one from dad, that have to be read in every cell simultaneously, and the information from them has to be sort of averaged together to produce you. And I have no idea what's at the bottom of that slide, but we'll just continue. So after uh, uh, they're made, according to the information that's in the blueprints in your DNA, uh, it turns out that proteins do most of the work in the cell and in the body. So just from left to right here, what goes on inside every single cell is you have these master blueprints, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, okay? And those basically uh, 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 consist of a language that contains only four types of letters for the most part, T, C, G, and A. And that DNA is converted in every cell and every body into a closely related molecule called RNA. And then this molecule is read out by a cell to create molecules in the form of proteins. And proteins are incredibly important because they do the vast bulk of the work inside, inside your body. So proteins do things as, as important and as diverse as catalyzing chemical reactions. In other words, speeding up all the chemical reactions that uh, uh, allow you to be alive. Um, they form structural scaffolds that give you uh, uh, form and function. Um, if you didn't have proteins, you would just be sort of a, a, a puddle of, of liquid DNA on the floor. Um, they they, certain proteins can act as motors to create motion. So your ability to flex your muscle, raise your hand to ask me a question, are all because certain proteins uh, uh, create form, create structure, create function, create motion. Other proteins transport material and information throughout a living organism, between cells, into cells, out of cells, between cells. So a small number of, of functions and certain types of work are actually carried out by RNA molecules, but the vast bulk of the duties and the work that's done in a living creature are done by proteins. And these proteins, the information that's necessary to know how to make and create any one particular type of protein originates, again, from the blueprints in every cell in your body in the form of DNA. So there are names given to these two processes of creating RNA from DNA and then creating protein from RNA. This process is called transcription. You're literally just transcribing a message 
uh, into more or less the same language, just on a new sheet of paper. And then translation. You're translating this information into the final product, sort of like reading blueprints and then actually following the directions to make a structure. Is everybody with me so far? All right. So how, what is the, 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 the uh, complexity of these blueprints? Well, in every uh, 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 set of blueprints, there are about 3 billion letters total. And again, you have two sets of blueprints in every cell in your body. Um, and those blueprints, those letters, those 3 billion letters, again, are arranged into specific chapters that are separated from one another. You can think of each uh, uh, chapter basically providing the information for a particular type of cell to become the correct type of cell. Um, they're organized into paragraphs. And you can think of each paragraph as basically being the instructions to make a single molecule and so on. And so the key thing here is that uh, fundamentally, the information that is encoded within the DNA in your cells is the information that's used to create every molecule, every structure, and every type of cell throughout your body. OK, so as I've already mentioned, the DNA blueprints uh, uh, in every cell in your body contain 3 billion letters. And again, every cell in every person contains two copies of these blueprints, one from your mom and one from your dad. And those blueprints are physically organized into these structures called chromosomes. Okay? And chromosome basically means colored body. It goes all the way back to when people first looked at cells with powerful microscopes and saw these structures inside cells that were colored in a particular way. And they ended up calling them chromosomes for colored bodies. What they were seeing were the nucleus inside all the cells. And that's where these blueprints reside. And these blueprints are organized into these really fabulous rolled up structures that have multiple layers of structure until you eventually get down to what uh, we commonly think of as DNA, this double helical structure that Watson and Crick figured out many decades ago. All right, now here's the key point of the whole talk that leads me to everything else I'm going to tell you about. So it turns out that if you have a mistake in the spelling of as few as one letter somewhere in a, a critical paragraph that provides the information for making a molecule, that that can cause a catastrophic mistake in the assembly of whatever molecule those instructions uh, are found in. So a mutation or a mistake in just one letter uh, of the genetic code can cause a catastrophic mistake uh, in the synthesis and therefore the function of a molecule that's probably going to be important for some aspect of your life. So let me give you a, an actual example. Shown here um, is, uh, uh, I'm going to actually use this to point. Can everybody see the cursor if I run it around? It's a little bit easier for me than trying to see over this curtain. So shown here is, th are three things. Um, on the right uh, uh, is a picture of red blood cells. These are called erythrocytes. These are the cells that are circulating through your bloodstream that are responsible for carrying oxygen from your lungs to all the tissues throughout your body. So these red blood cells circulate into your lungs and they bind oxygen, the oxygen that you're breathing in through your trachea. Uh, and then they set out on a course through your bloodstream to all the tissues in your body where they know eventually to release oxygen to all of your tissues. And the reason that these cells are red is that inside these cells they are packed full of a protein called hemoglobin. Okay? And shown on the left here is a cartoon representation of the atomic structure of hemoglobin. So this is a protein that's made according to instructions within the DNA blueprints, specifically in red blood cells, that's responsible for carrying oxygen around the body. So these letters down here, starting with A, T, G, G, T, G, C, A, C, C, and so on, that is the paragraph of information from the blueprints that provide all the information for your, your red blood cells to know to make millions of copies of this molecule, hemoglobin. Does everybody follow me? So this little bit of uh, red spherage right here is an, is an oxygen molecule being captured and held onto by hemoglobin. And it's actually stuck to a small molecule called heme that's part of the overall structure of the protein. So all the green uh, ribbon here and the loops that connect all the green ribbon are part of a protein molecule that functions, its sole purpose 
is to bind heme and thereby bind oxygen and then carry it from your lungs all throughout your body. And again, it's these letters right here that are a very small part of the three billion letters in the human genome that provide all the information necessary to make this molecule. Okay? All right? So, imagine, and well, don't imagine, this is reality, that you have a mutation, a mistake, where this letter right here, this A, and only this A out of this entire paragraph of information from the blueprints is accidentally turned into a T. One letter mistake in this paragraph. That causes a corresponding mistake in the creation of this molecule where one, just a few small number of atoms shown right here change from oxygens, which are the red balls, to carbons, which are the green balls. So you just have, so there are about 2,000 atoms in this entire protein, and only three or four of the atoms are actually changed as a result of this single letter misspelling in this DNA blueprint. And this particular paragraph is called a gene. Okay? A gene is a paragraph of information in the DNA blueprints that provides all the information necessary to make a molecule, in this case, the hemoglobin protein. So this one single letter mistake, a genetic mutation, causes a mistake of just a few atoms in an otherwise very, very large molecule. And that leads to catastrophic problems in the ability of hemoglobin to bind and release oxygen properly as it travels from the lungs to your tissues. And it actually causes blood cells to take on this shape here called a sickled shape. So this mutation, a single base pair mutation, a, a mistake in the spelling of one letter, causes a disease called sickle cell disease. Okay? This is a classic uh, type of genetic disease that's taught basically in the first year of biochemistry that anybody takes, as well as these days in high school biology. Is everybody following me? So this is an example of what's called a monogenic disease. Mono meaning one. So it's a disease caused by a mutation in one and exactly one gene, one paragraph out of the entire set of blueprints causes a mistake in making one molecule that leads to a catastrophic dysfunction in the ability of this molecule to do what it's supposed to do. Okay? I don't see any hands going up so far, so either I'm a fantastic lecturer or you guys are just being shy, but that's okay. So let's talk a little bit more about sickle cell disease, and that's going to lead me to the broader issue of genetic diseases as a whole. So sickle cell diseases. Um, you have, remember, two copies uh, of, of the blueprints in every cell in your body, one from your mom, one from your dad. So let's suppose that within those two copies of the blueprints, you get one from your dad that has perfectly normal and correct um, um, uh, blueprints for hemoglobin, and you get one from your, from your mom that's got that mistake. Okay, at that point, you would be a carrier of the disease. You'd have one correct copy and one incorrect copy of those uh, 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 blueprints. So you wouldn't have the disease, but you would have the potential to pass on the disease to your own offspring. You would be a carrier, okay? You would carry the trait for sickle cell disease, okay? Now, if, on the other hand, your mother and your father were both carriers. They each had one bad copy of the blueprints for hemoglobin. And you happen to inherit the bad copy from both of them, then you would have the disease because you would have nothing but two bad copies of the blueprints for this, okay? So you wouldn't be a carrier. You would actually be afflicted with the disease. Does everybody follow me? So, yes, sir. Oh, that's a great question. So sickle cell disease, as I'm going to come to in a moment, is a disease that really is predominant in uh, uh, the African population and in the African-American population. Um, and for many years now, uh, testing for sickle cell trait has been done pretty routinely at birth, particularly in the African-American population, um, because it is possible to look and see if that trait, if you're carrying that trait in, in one allele. So that's a very good question. So, 
that actually led right into, uh, I've already made this point, which is that this particular disease is most commonly found in sub-Saharan Africa, where about a quarter of the people uh, 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 in that part of the world carry the trait. And about 2% roughly actually have the disease. And then it's uh, also uh, uh, found you know, fairly commonly in African Americans who are descended from sub-Saharan uh, African populations. So here's, here's the important point. If you have sickle cell disease, for the most part, your life expectancy is going to be reduced by about 20 years. Okay? If you're in America and you have access to the very best possible medical care, in many cases now, people can live into their 70s. But if you don't have access to really outstanding medical care, your life expectancy is going to be significantly reduced if you have sickle cell uh, disease. And you, regardless of the quality of the care that you have access to, you are going to deal for your entire life, if you have the disease, with a variety of lifelong symptoms and complications, anemia, blood clots, chronic pain, strokes, spleen failure, infections, aplastic crises, bone necrosis, hypertension, renal failure, retinopathy, um, and you're going to spend a lot of your life taking pain medications for all the above, which has its own issues. Aside from that, you're doing great. Okay? So this, I point this out because this is in, uh, 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 illustrative of the issue surrounding genetic diseases. These are incredibly cruel diseases because of the fact that unlike bacterial infections, viral infections, even cancer that can be hopefully treated and cured with appropriate therapies, chemotherapy, antibiotics, antiviral drugs, genetic diseases usually cannot be cured because the cause of the disease is written into your DNA. It's written into your blueprints. So unless you have a way to get into those blueprints and correct the underlying mutation, in the appropriate cells in your body, all you can really do for a patient with a genetic disease is treat their symptoms over their lifetime. You can provide them with palliative care and symptom treating care, but you can't cure the underlying cause of the disease. So genetic diseases, it turns out, are very asymmetric or disproportional in the effect they have on populations in terms of suffering. Uh, and also just in terms of cost, because people are treated for more or less their entire lifetime. So genetic dis disorders come in many, many types, and they're all more or less, almost all of them are currently incurable. So again, inherited or acquired DNA mutations that cause genetic diseases, they can be the direct cause of many genetic diseases. So hemophilia, which is a, uh, a blood clotting disease, cystic fibrosis, which largely affects your lungs and your breathing, sickle cell disease, which affects oxygen transport, and other types of uh, uh, genetic diseases can predispose individuals to sickness, diabetes, cancer, um, many different diseases. So I use the term monogenic diseases, uh, uh, diseases caused by mutations in one gene. There are over 400 known human diseases that are monogenic diseases that are caused by mutation in a single gene. They affect about 1% of the population. So just in the United States alone, about 3 million individuals suffer from various monogenic diseases. They are by far the most common reason for pediatric hospitalizations. Um, many of these diseases are extremely catastrophic. I've already told you sickle cell is not a disease that you want, and that's probably one of the more mild genetic diseases compared to many of them. And again, treatment is lifelong. It's almost always extremely expensive and not curative. Okay, so in terms of thinking about trying to help people, help people who are ill, genetic diseases sort of represent the highest possible bar of, of trying to do, uh, do something difficult. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Based on the percentage that I saw where there are 25% that are carriers, and, but in fact there's only 2% that result in the disease, just because you have two people who are carriers, it doesn't mean if they That's right. have offspring. That's right. You would expect by chance that one out of four of their children should get the disease because they have the possibility of getting the, the two correct genes from mom and dad or a correct gene from mom, a bad gene from dad, or vice versa. So, yes. 
Anybody else? Okay. Is there another question? Everybody good? Two percent is one out of ten. Yeah, so there are other factors that, that factor, fact, factor into this, factor into it. But that's about the, the numbers that, in terms of, at any moment in time, the number of people walking around with, 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 with the disease in, in that part of the world. With um, biracial marriages, black and white, um, it is decreasing the amount of uh, bicycle or... Uh, well, it's just the that the, that particular genetic uh, uh, mutation is found less commonly in Caucasian populations. It's just uh, um, um, the, the way that that particular disease has has spread with you know human migration over hundreds of thousands of years. So so yes, where the disease is most predominantly found is 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 in uh, 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 African and African American populations. And obviously, if you have a biracial uh, uh, marriage producing children, you're a little bit less likely to have the trait because just the distribution. You know, there are other genetic diseases that are very specific to completely different types of uh, geographical backgrounds. There's a related disease also of the hemoglobin gene called beta thalassemia. That's very common in populations from the Arabian Peninsula. Um, there, is, uh, you know, there are diseases that track with almost any nationality or ethnic background that you can imagine. 400 diseases uh, as a whole, they don't discriminate. There are hum any human population has certain genetic diseases that are really prevalent in that population. Yes, sir? Does this apply also to mental disorders that pass on in families? You know, that's a much more complicated question because most mental and uh, cognitive disorders uh, are known to not be monogenic, not caused necessarily by a mutation in a single gene, but instead have many different genes and environmental factors weighing on them. So it's much more difficult to parse out the genetic component of schizophrenia or, or cognitive disorders like that. So it's just a much more difficult question. There's no doubt that there is a genetic component because it's clear that certain cognitive disorders definitely can be found to, to pass in families. But the, the underlying genetics are just much more complicated than these type of diseases, which are monogenic and easy to track. Any, anyone else? Yes, yeah, ma'am. Just one more. So can you speak just briefly to, you know, it seems like if, if there are, it, it requires two people in order for that disease to manifest itself, the, the chances of that mutation occurring, it would have had to have have occurred in at least two people, right? Right. For, in order for it to be propagated, the chances of that particular mutation happening in more than one person seems so extremely slight. Is there any insight into how those so, mutations happen in the first place? Well, so the mutations happen just randomly um, because DNA mutates at a certain steady frequency every time that you make new copies of DNA. Uh, an interesting fact about sickle cell disease, um, you might ask why would such a high percentage of people in sub-Saharan Africa be carriers of the trait, 25%. It turns out that if you're a carrier, you don't have the disease, but it turns out you do have a trait, uh, which is you are resistant to the effects of malaria. Um, it turns out that if you are a carrier, uh, you're much, much less likely to die from malaria, and malaria is a hugely endemic, very devastating infectious disease in sub-Saharan Africa. So you actually, if you're a carrier, have a substantial advantage. Um, so there's, a, there's actually been, over eons, uh, 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 an advantage to being a carrier of sickle cell, and that's allowed the trait to sort of persist in the human population. But otherwise, you know, any one of these diseases actually happen at a very low level. It's the cumulative number of 400 different genetic diseases that give you 1% burden overall. So let's go on a little bit, and I really appreciate the questions. It makes it much more fun, and then we'll uh, pause again. So I'm happy to report that technology now exists, and it's really been created very recently, to specifically alter DNA sequences within human chromosomes, to be able to go into a cell um, and actually rewrite uh, uh, the blueprints at the level of one base or two bases or many bases very, very specifically, okay? So how is that possible? How does it work? I'm gonna give you just sort of 
a, uh, an animation version, and then I'll tell you some of the specifics and where our lab has played a role in this. Imagine you've got a cell. It could be a cell in a Petri dish, a cell that you've taken out of a patient and you've cultured in a test tube, or it could be a cell in a, an actual living body. And inside that cell, inside the nucleus, are, is, are the blueprints, you know, the, 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 gene, the human genome. And imagine that somewhere in one uh, 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 chapter, one paragraph, somewhere in that uh, uh, DNA is a genetic mutation, okay, a mutation that causes a disease. I've also said, or viral DNA, and we'll come back to that at the very end of the talk. But for the moment, imagine that somewhere in, in these blueprints uh, is a mutation that causes a disease. It can be that change from an A to a T that causes sickle cell. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to somehow rewrite those blueprints and correct that mutation within living cells. Well, imagine that I could somehow deliver a correct version of just that page of the blueprints, not the entire set, but just that paragraph. And imagine I could do that and deliver uh, 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 the correct sequence, the correct paragraph into cells. What would be great would be if the cells would just automatically just see that as, as DNA information that they want to replace the original blueprints with. Does everybody follow that? Now, it turns out that if you're a yeast cell, that's all you need to do. It turns out that if you take a yeast cell and you inject or somehow chemically make DNA go into a yeast cell, yeast are very accepting of incoming DNA as long as they recognize it as being very similar to the DNA sequence they already have. So yeast are what we call naturally recombinogenic. They love to recombine their own DNA with incoming DNA. And that's part of microbes in general are happy to do that because they might gain an advantage. There might be something good in that, those new instructions. And so yeast and bacteria tend to be naturally accepting of incoming DNA. And they will often replace their own DNA with similar DNA. And whoever has an advantage, they just sort of win out. Okay? But in human cells, this doesn't work because we have developed um, um, blockades to incoming D foreign DNA, uh, rewriting our own DNA, not, not surprisingly. You really don't want whatever foreign DNA you come in contact with rewriting your genetic code. So there are specific uh, 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 mechanisms to sort of put up a barrier uh, to prevent you from rewriting DNA in any of your cells with foreign DNA that happens to get into them. Okay. So you need a little something more if you want to rewrite the DNA sequence in a human cell. So imagine that I could introduce into human cells two things, okay? The, uh, a stretch of DNA that's very similar to what's already in your blueprints, but with the sequence somewhere that I, I would like to correct. And then a second something, which I've drawn as Pac-Man, which is going to get in the nucleus, and it's going to have the magical property of searching out, finding, recognizing and attaching itself to the specific DNA sequence that I would like to alter and rewrite. Okay, does everybody follow that? So this mysterious something that looks like Pac-Man has the ability to scan three billion letters of the blueprints, okay, and find one particular sequence in one particular gene that, that I tell it to and attach itself there. Okay, it's like a guided missile. And then what it's going to do is it's not going to stop just at attaching itself. It's actually going to open up the DNA. It's going to cut the two strands and make a double strand break. It's going to physically open up the DNA. At this point now, the cell recognizes that this is something that's got to get fixed. You can't have broken chromosomes inside cells. And so the cell looks around for some source of DNA to use to repair this break, and lo and behold, it's got this DNA that I've already introduced, and so it goes ahead and faithfully copies the, the incoming DNA to fix the break, and in so doing, inadvertently rewrites the blueprints exactly the way I wanted. Does everybody follow that? So the key point there is that thing that thus far I've drawn as Pac-Man has the incredible ability to very rapidly, inside a cell, inside a nucleus, scan all three billion letters of the DNA blueprints and find a sequence of my choosing 
and sit down on it, bind it, and cut it, and then allow a correction to happen. Yeah? Um, does the cellular machinery like automatically um, take that or, uh, introduced DNA and integrate it? Um, yeah, basically the only, you know, cellular machinery is going to take, take care of everything except for my little extra something that I've added that, that yeah. searches out and opens up the DNA at a location. Okay. Outside of that, it's going to be natural molecules that are already inside the cell, already primed to, to fix a break that are going to finish off the whole process for me. So I just need that one molecule, okay? All right. So. I'm going to correct a single gene in a human cell. I'm going to find a mutation. I'm going to fix that mutation. And I'm going to leave the other 3 billion letters completely alone. I'm not going to touch them, OK? This is the ultimate needle in a haystack challenge. And just to reiterate, I've already shown this slide once. The human genome consists of 3 billion letters of DNA, OK? And our goal is to correct one letter or word somewhere in that set of blueprints. So what is this mysterious Pac-Man? Where do I find it? How do I get it, OK? Well, where can I find a molecule capable of recognizing and altering the sequence of one unique target in the human genome, in, in the DNA blueprints? Where can I find it? Well, when you've got a technical problem, when you need something to, to do something, you've got two options. And the first is invent the wheel from scratch. And the second is find someone who's already got a wheel and steal it from them, right? And so fortunately, I didn't have to solve the problem of creating a DNA targeting molecule and I don't think I would ever be smart enough to do so. But the incredible universe of microbes has already solved the problem. So it turns out that bacteria and fungi and algae and little creatures you know, swimming around in pond scum and in dirt and wherever, they've already created gene targeting proteins, DNA targeting proteins. And the reason they've done this is that microbial life has been engaged and is engaged at this very moment in genetic warfare, okay? They're constantly fighting it out. Two bacteria come within contact with one another. They're trying to either knock out the other guy's DNA or at the very least insert a piece of their own DNA into the other guy's DNA. And it's going both directions. So microbes of all forms are, have already managed to create DNA targeting molecules for the purpose of warfare to try to take out the other guy or insert some of their own sequence into the other guys. Everybody follow that? So, this, it's already been solved. All we had to do was find these molecules. And fortunately, people had already been studying bacterial genetics and fungal genetics for years, and then put these to our own purpose. And so there are currently four different types of gene targeting molecules that are used for the type of gene therapy I've just described, all from microbes, all uh, have been created by those microbes due to the genetic warfare they've been uh, doing for millions of years. And these are just two particular types of gene targeting molecules uh, that we've studied in my lab. And again, you're seeing these very uh, artistic sort of colored, color cartoons of gene targeting proteins. So one of these is called a homing endonuclease. It's, they're also called meganucleases. The other is called a tal effector. And you don't need to worry about where they came from. Suffice it to say that what these are are DNA targeting molecular scissors. Okay? They find a DNA sequence very specifically, ignore all the other DNA that they were, were, aren't interested in. They bind to the DNA, and then they make a cut. So let me ask you this. So as everybody looks at these cartoons, can everybody see the DNA and the protein in those two molecules? Does everybody recognize the double helix of the DNA? It's the gray. And then the protein is the colored stuff. And when you look at these, hopefully what you can see is those two proteins, they're doing the same thing. They're recognizing a DNA sequence and attaching themselves to it. And eventually, eventually they're going to cut the DNA. But they're doing it with very, very different shapes and in very different ways. So the one on the left is just kind of sitting down on the side of the DNA. And the one on the right is winding itself around the DNA like vines on a, on a tree trunk. Does everybody follow that? But the underlying chemistry is the same. You've got DNA with all the letters and bases. And these proteins scan the DNA until they see just the right sequence of letters, usually about 20 of them in a row. And they say, there it is. That's my target. And down they sit. And they grab on. And then they make the cut. Does everybody follow that? So this is what we've been studying for years. And all we had to do, once we had solved these structures and had figured out how these things had worked, is we, figured, we had to figure out 
how to engineer these molecules to recognize a DNA sequence of our own heart's desire, our own choosing. Because remember, these things have been created by microbes to recognize some sequence in some other microbe for the purpose of genetic warfare. I need to repurpose these things to instead recognize a DNA sequence in the sickle, uh, the hemoglobin gene, okay, or the cystic fibrosis gene. So I had to re-engineer these proteins to recognize new DNA sequences, okay? So if you're willing to be patient enough, you can eventually figure out how to do this. We started working on this problem in 1997 when we solved the first uh, atomic structure of one of these. I thought at the time it would take us uh, about two, three years. I wrote a grant proposal to the NIH. I said, give me, you know, a lot of money and give me five years and I'll, I'll have it done for you, okay? So 16 years later, uh, which is the bulk of my career here at the center, we finally got there, uh, creating what we call rare cleaving nucleases for therapeutic genome engineering. Hopefully everybody follows that title. Therapeutic meaning therapy. Genome engineering, meaning I'm going to change the genome, I'm going to change the blueprints for the purpose of curing a disease. So I mention this because I was a, a young, excited man when I sort of got going on this. Uh, now I'm a considerably grayer, slightly older, but still very enthusiastic man, and we're there now. We're ready to start doing this therapeutically. So the last little bit of the talk, we're right on time, is to sort of return to sickle disease and tell you how we're going to do it. Okay, so is everybody still with me? All right, I gotta say it's a pleasure to talk about this at this pace because normally uh, it's, I, they ask me to do this in eight minutes and it's just, uh, it's really fun to get to slow down and go through this. All right, so this is the way it's gonna work in just sort of like real generic terms. You're gonna have a patient, he's got sickle cell disease or he's got thalassemia or he or she has got uh, boy in the bubble disease, some disease where they've got a mutation in their DNA. And one of the things about sickle cell disease that's useful is it's a disease where the cells that are affected are the red blood cells in your body. So the tissue you're working with is the blood, which means you can take the cells, the stem cells, out of the bloodstream. You can put them in a Petri dish, and then you can do your gene targeting and correct the DNA in the cells in a Petri dish. You don't have to put the protein into the person. You do it ex vivo, outside the body. You then put the, engineer, the cells with the correct DNA back into the patient using a, a stem cell trans, uh, transplant type technology. And fortunately, I'm at the Hutchinson Center. If there's one thing the Hutchinson Center knows how to do really well, it's autologous stem cell transplants. So all of this is stuff that the Hutch and the doctors here already know how to do really well for the purpose of treating cancer. I'm just adding this little tweak right here where I'm going to intercept the cells and I'm going to treat them, okay, as I've already shown you, to alter the DNA sequence. And then I'll give them back to the, the doctors. Actually, I'll never touch these cells. But in my mind, I will give them back to the doctors and they will go ahead and transplant the person, cure him of his sickle cell disease, okay? So coming back to sickle cell disease. Again, we've got this mutation that causes uh, 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 this, this distortion in the protein. What is the correction that we want to do? Um, it turns out one of the beautiful things about being a basic scientist here but being interested in medicine is that we have people like Michael Bender who is a, a, a clinician. And Michael, um, um, or he, he just prefers to go by Bender. Um, he, tr he treats people with sickle cell disease. That is his absolute specialty as well as being an oncologist. And he made a, an incredibly crucial discovery uh, just simply by staring at people's genetics. Um, so biologically, the way that sickle cell disease works is it turns out you don't have one hemoglobin gene. Um, you have three of them uh, right next to one another in the blueprints. For, for one part of the hemoglobin gene. You have one that's expressed when you're an embryo from the time of conception uh, through early part of being an embryo. And then once uh, uh, you go from being an embryo to being a fetus with a developing circulatory system and you're bringing in oxygen from the placenta, that form of hemoglobin goes away and a different form of hemoglobin called fetal hemoglobin comes up instead. And then right around the time you're born, nine months after you're conceived, fetal hemoglobin goes away and the hemoglobin that you will produce for the rest of your life comes up. 
So you actually make three different types of hemoglobin in a row when you're an embryo, when you're a fetus, and then when you are after you're born. And this is called globin switching. Does everybody follow me? And the reason for that is that you get your oxygen very different ways at those three stages. When you're an embryo, oxygen just diffuses into the cells. When you're a fetus, you're getting oxygen from the placenta. And when you're born, you're breathing in the oxygen yourself through your lungs. So you need three different types of hemoglobin in order. And again, what happens in uh, 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 sickle cell disease is you have a mutation that knocks out, that disrupts the function of your adult hemoglobin, so you never make this form of hemoglobin. So people who have sickle cell disease, they actually start to show uh, symptoms uh, a few months after they're born. They're perfectly healthy when they're first born, and then they, sickling comes, sickle cell disease comes on when they're early toddlers or maybe before they start to walk, because it takes a while before the fetal hemoglobin has totally gone away, and that's when the disease comes on. All right? But it turns out there are very rare individuals, and someone in this audience may be one of them and not even know it, but there are rare individuals in the human population who never, ever stop making fetal hemoglobin. They just keep making it the rest of their lives, along with the, the adult version. This is a, a, something called hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin, okay? And it doesn't cause you any problems. You're not sick. You're just walking around making uh, the same hemoglobin you made when you were a fetus. And the cool thing is that if you happen to have this trait, if you happen to be one of those rare people who never stops making fetal hemoglobin, even if you have this, the, the mutation that causes sickle disease, you don't get sick because this fetal version of hemoglobin protects you. It just sort of takes over. Does everybody follow that? Yes, sir. Um, does fetal hemoglobin play any role in adult respiration? It just takes over, and you can, yeah, it, you can use it very effectively. Um, and that's why you don't get sick if you have fetal hemoglobin. So again, there may be someone in this crowd who has this trait, and uh, you would have no way of knowing it because you'd just be walking around happy as a clam, okay? But if you happen to have the sickling, uh, 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 what would otherwise be sickle cell disease, and you have this trait, you basically are protected from the disease. So that's pretty neat, right? So what Bender figured out was he figured out exactly what the genetic changes in the blueprints that causes people to have this trait, this this feature that they never turn off their fetal hemoglobin. And what they've got is they've got a small chunk of the blueprints actually ripped out altogether. Just a page has been taken out. A paragraph has been cut out of the blueprints. They have a very small deletion of about 300 DNA bases right here in between this gene and this gene. This is called a non-coding a non region of the genome. It's not sitting in a paragraph that actually encodes a protein. It's sitting in what we used to call non-coding DNA. Does everybody follow that? But what we now know is there's no such thing as non-coding DNA. Pretty much all DNA is providing some sort of information. And this particular little stretch is providing the necessary information to tell fetal hemoglobin normally shut off uh, at birth, okay? Somewhere in those 300 base pairs is information telling fetal hemoglobin to stop being made when you're born. And so we came up with the idea, as soon as this was published by the clinicians here, what if we introduce two of these Pac-Men, no DNA, no other DNA whatsoever, and instead of trying to do a correction, we just cut out that piece altogether and just stitch the ends together. We basically just recapitulate the genetic uh, 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 mutation that causes the disease. Basically, nature and genetics have already done the clinical trial for us. Does that make sense? Because we already know that if you're missing these 300 base pairs, uh, you don't get sickle cell disease. So what if we could just treat cells with two of these Pac-Men and just cut it out and recapitulate something that lots of people already have, or a tiny percentage of people already have? Does everybody follow that? Again, the idea is, uh, human genetics and the human population have already done the clinical trial at a first level for us. And so this is, again, the region of the blueprints that have the instructions that somehow, in some magical way that we do not understand yet, somewhere in this paragraph are instructions that say, when you're born, stop making fetal hemoglobin. Okay? One of the things we'd now like to do in my lab is we'd like to understand exactly how these instructions, uh, uh, how these letters convey that information. That's one thing we're going to start looking at. So, we went ahead and made two such uh, molecular scissors. And this is the only piece of data that I'll show you in the talk, and then we're done. So we are right on time here. Um, 
this is a, a, an experiment that literally has been done one time, so there's no error bars. Um, we've done it in a cell line, a highly artificial cell line, and what we're looking for is, is how much fetal hemoglobin expression goes up, how much more of these cells start making fetal hemoglobin when we treat them with our two molecular scissors compared to no treatment. And what you see is in this experiment, uh, it goes up about 40 to 50 times. We get what would be a, a robust therapeutic benefit in, term, in a petri dish at least. Okay? So this is the proof of principle that if we do that, if we treat these cells and re-edit the genome to just take out, snip out that little bit of DNA, fetal hemoglobin comes up. Basically leading us to the idea that we can actually come up with a very specific uh, disease, uh, uh, strategy that in theory could just cure people of sickle cell disease altogether. Okay? So this is my last slide. Just simply pointing out that what I've just described to you, again, hopefully what you'll take home is um, there's a little bit of biology, a little bit of chemistry, a whole lot of time and dollars and sweat and labor and love put into this to get from point A to point B. But this is part of a much bigger picture at the hutch of stuff that we're, going, uh, that we're uh, looking at. We're looking at this, these diseases called hemoglobinopathies, sickle cell anemia and then thalassemia, which I mentioned is another genetic disease affecting hemoglobin that affects mostly people of Arabian descent. Um, I mentioned viruses, and it turns out that people are trying to create molecular scissors to actually cut out viral DNA. So certain viruses have the ability to put their own DNA into your DNA. So HIV and hepatitis B and other types of viruses, they actually integrate their own DNA into, into the patient's DNA, and therefore you can never totally get rid of the virus because the virus is actually part of the blueprints itself. So people are now at the hutch trying to come up with molecular scissor strategies to do genome editing and just cut out viral DNA the same way I'm trying to cut out those instructions for fetal hemoglobin. That started with actually a very small pilot grant that was funded by individual donors and has been leveraged into now tremendous interest from the NIH to try to create genetic strategies to cure HIV and hepatitis B. We're uh, working very hard on cystic fibrosis. We're engineering the genomes of T cells for cancer immunotherapy. And we're even engineering the genomes of mosquitoes to try to uh, 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 combat malaria in Africa. And in fact, in November, I was actually in Burkina Faso talking to investigators there about ways to try to do uh, uh, um, gene therapy strategies to try to combat malaria. So it's really exciting times. Um, uh, to me, when we first started thinking about the possibilities of this back in the late 1990s, it was utterly pie in the sky. It was kind of like, to, to, to in my way, sort of like when John Kennedy said, you know, we're going to go to the moon in a decade, you know, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. That's kind of like where we were at when we started thinking about this 16 years ago, and now we're there. We're actually like starting to, to, to do this for reals. Um, and so with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I will take as many questions as you guys want to ask. Uh, and thank you very, very much. Yeah. Hello. I have a, a question about if you, you said that uh, this paragraph, if it's in a language that you can't understand, you don't know how the, what the information is conveying, how do you make sure you get your scissors in the right place? That's a good question. So certain paragraphs, I understand them perfectly and can read them absolutely perfectly. So any paragraph that has the instructions for making a protein, that I understand and can read perfectly because I know exactly uh, how the language of DNA gets turned into uh, the language of a, of a protein as it's made. But when it's a paragraph that has a more mysterious uh, uh, a piece of information such as uh, uh, turn off this gene right when you're born. That's, that's, that's a paragraph where the letters are the same, but they're making words that I have never encountered. I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I don't, and I don't have a dictionary to look up the words. So in that case, at the moment, all we're thinking of doing is let's just cut out that whole paragraph uh, altogether because we know because of human genetics, uh, that if we do that, we'll get the desired outcome. But we don't know precisely what the instructions correspond to that we're getting rid of. Does that make sense? So in some cases, I know precisely what I'm changing and why. In other cases, uh, you know, things are much more mysterious. It just so happens that 
uh, human biology informed us uh, about where, what we need to cut out uh, without understanding why we need to cut it out? It's a great question. Yes, sir? That's a great question. Yeah, that's right. They would still, because all you're going to do is, so remember, uh, different chapters of the blueprints are read by different cell types. And certain chapters, certain cell types never, ever look at. Um, so a red blood cell doesn't need to know anything about the instructions to, for how to become a bone cell. So yes, I am going to do genetic modification in cells corresponding to the bloodstream, hematopoietic cells they're called, to uh, rewrite the code for making hemoglobin in the bloodstream. But the underlying, what we call the germline, basically, you know, the DNA that you might pass on to your children, that would not be touched. You would, you're, you, the, 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 the genetic information you would pass on to future generations would be, would be just the same. Yeah, so we're talking about a very tissue or cell specific uh, uh, gene modification to cure the, the manifestations of a disease specific to that tissue? It's a great question. Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Uh, in theory, possibly. I, I doubt that that would ever actually happen because there's such a much less expensive strategy probably which is just simply uh, you know now it's getting to the point where the cost of actually testing people for traits for all 400 diseases pretty soon it's going to be done for hundred be, be capable for hundreds of dollars and so in theory if if we wanted to go that direction for hundreds of dollars per person everybody could know whether or not they had disease traits and could make informed decisions based on that about whether to have children and, and so on. So maybe you could think about genetic modification, but probably that will never, ever happen because there's just simpler things to try. There was a hand. Yes, ma'am. If you were, um, if you didn't know about the fetal hemoglobin, would you still be able to do what you're suggesting or is it, sim is it partly because you were connected with that's an excellent question. Um, so if that information didn't exist about globin switching and about this really cool little trait that some people have, could we still do this? And the answer is what we would have to try to do would be to actually correct the adult hemoglobin gene, um, which it turns out for technical reasons is more difficult. It's easier to just cut out a little bit of DNA than to physically correct a stretch of DNA. So it was just this case where the stars aligned perfectly and we had the geneticists who knew exactly what would probably work and it's a fairly straightforward idea. So your, your question is, is spot on that uh, uh, we're benefiting in this case from a target of almost perfect opportunity. It just so happens it's for a disease that would be wonderful to be able to treat in this manner. So great question. Let's hang on one second. There's one over here. Yes, sir. Dr. Stoddard, will we ever see a Pac-Man who can or she can look at all 3.2 billion bases and you know bind repair slice every possible so is it product. possible to make because any one particular dna targeting molecule you're going to engineer for, very specifically for one and only one gene one and only one site so the way i would interpret that question is will we eventually be able to make a pac-man for any site that we want anywhere in the genome? Um, the answer is yes. Um, the technology is rapidly moving that direction. It turns out, again, I mentioned there are actually four different types of DNA recognizing molecular scissors that people around the world are working with for this sort of application. So between all four and the many labs that are working on this, uh, yeah, the entire human, any gene, any disease is theoretically targetable. Um, uh, with this sort of technology, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, is your lab's application like uh, of these proteins focused right now on um, sickle, cell, sickle cell anemia, or are there other diseases? That so sickle cell anemia is really the one we're primarily focused on. We've done a lot of work uh, with cystic fibrosis as well, and so that's a good segue to probably the last point I want to make, which is. Um, 
what's, what's the big next difficult hurdle we have to face? So we've kind of, for a long time, the hurdle was making molecules that can target DNA very specifically right where we want. But now the hurdle is getting the exact repair outcome that we want to happen. Um, and, and the second hurdle is deliv delivery to the right cells at the right time. Because you have billions of cells in your body comprising hundreds of different types of tissues. And any one genetic disease affects usually one tissue or another. So sickle cell, as I mentioned, is easy because it's a, a, a disease largely of your red blood cells and your bloodstream. It's easy to extract blood cells out of a patient, do the gene treatment, and put them back in. But in contrast, cystic fibrosis, that's a disease that largely affects the epithelial lining of the lungs, as well as several other organs. Uh, it's just, you know, people don't think so much about cystic fibrosis in the pancreas. Uh, uh, which is another organ affected by, by that mutation because people die of infections in their lungs. But as soon as you start thinking about trying to deliver these things into cells in a solid tissue in a patient, um, the problem of delivery and specificity, getting it into just the right cells and just the right tissues, becomes the big hurdle. And so that's really where the field is now at. The problem of making the molecules to target DNA, that's pretty much solved. Now it's a question of, what tissues or what cells in a, a patient do you need to target for any one particular disease? Okay? So that's kind of where we're at. Um, yeah? Is it possible to be able to just DNA in every single cell in the body? I don't think there's an easy way to actually access the DNA in every cell in the body because one of the things that you have, you can only really access DNA in cells that are rapidly dividing and proliferating. So it's difficult in what we call quiescent cells or quiescent tissues, to, like adult muscle, to, to, to access DNA. But I think you would always want to figure out a way to target very specific tissues and just the cells that you need to, to really uh, treat a disease. Yes. Yes, sir. Well, <clears throat> these cells are replicating all the time, and you've got 3.2 billion of them. Do they degrade over time? So, you know, you're treating something that, as life goes on, I don't know if you clone sheep, if, after you've cloned so many of them, the process becomes degraded. It's a good question. It's a complicated question. So the DNA changes that we make are going to be just as permanent once they're done as any other uh, uh, region of the blueprints. But the key point here is that DNA, every time that a cell makes a copy of itself, it makes a mistake in at least one base in the human genome. Every single, every single time a cell divides in your body, you introduce at least one, muta one base mutation somewhere in the blueprints, every single time. You know? So in the time it takes, it's taking me to answer this question, I will have introduced probably 100 million mutations in cells throughout my body because it's about 100 million cells that divide every minute in your body. Now, so no matter how hard you concentrate, you can't stop from making mistakes at the genetic level. Um, so you, know, I, I int you introduce a, a, a DNA change, a DNA correction. It will be fixed in the DNA, but then it will be subject to the same type of mutational rate as the rest of your DNA. Um, so I'm not sure I'm answering your question other than in a particular cell, in a particular tissue, you can, in theory, sort of alter a, a specific mutation to restore normal function of a molecule. But then subsequent to that, that corrected gene is then going to behave genetically just like any other element of DNA in subsequent cell division and just life itself. Yes, sir. Ma'am, sorry. Bright light in my face, sorry. I can repeat the question, no problem. That's a good question. That's a really good question. So what you would like to do, really, so does everybody know what a stem cell is? So, so you know, when, I, when you say stem cells, people often think embryonic stem cells, but that's not what I'm talking about. Throughout your body and every, tish, every tissue in your body has a small number of cells that are 
tissue specific stem cells that can regenerate that particular tissue. Throughout your entire body, you have various, you have skin stem cells, uh, stomach stem cells, whatever, blood, hematopoietic or blood stem cells. So if you could do the gene correction in a hematopoietic stem cell, that would be basically be a lifetime correction because in theory, those hematopoietic stem cells would continuously make you, you know, new components of your blood for the rest of your life. Providing that you either knocked out the original hematopoietic stem cells, um, or in some cases, when you fix a mutated gene and return the cells to a person, those, those cells actually have a little bit of an advantage. They're a little healthier, so over time they sort of push out the original stem cells. So the, the, the hard part is that it turns out stem cells are particularly difficult to introduce DNA and genetic changes into. So whereas other types of cells that aren't stem cells are a little bit easier to manipulate. So um, doing this in actual stem cells of tissues is another sort of like challenge that people are trying to figure out right now. It's a great question. Yeah. Um, when you're looking at delivery of uh, these proteins and genetic material, um, what viral vectors are you looking at? Oh, there's all sorts of different ways to try to uh, get proteins and DNA into cells. And sometimes you deliver them with engineered viruses. And in other times, you just deliver them with lip droplets or just electricity and naked DNA. There's lots of different ways to get these molecules into cells, particularly if you can get the cells out of the patient and do it in a Petri dish and then put them back into the patient. But if you're doing it inside a patient, if you're actually like delivering these things into a patient, then you really do have to use like an engineered virus or something to, to get the DNA in. Oh, what types of viruses are you looking at? There's a lot of, of different types of viruses that are used for traditional gene therapy, so we can talk about that later, Okay, for sure. Yes, sir? I'm wondering, so about sickle cell patients. Yeah. With the technique you're doing with to get the fetal thingamajigger in there. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, does that mean, does that mean that you're only looking to treat children? Oh, no, or? no, not by any means. So what we would like to do, um, so n normally uh, uh, you or me, we're, we're just making the adult form of hemoglobin. We long ago stopped making fetal hemoglobin. You know, as soon as we were born, that gene turned off and it never got turned back on. What I want to do is for someone like myself or yourself, someone who has sickle cell, um, regardless of their age, is do a treatment in cells fr taken from their bloodstream that turn that gene back on. So basically what would happen if you had sickle disease and, and we treated you is we would put these cells back in and those cells now would be remaking a protein, fetal hemoglobin, that you had not been making since you were born, basically. We'd just be turning a gene back on that had been turned off when you were born. So yeah, it, this is intended to be a treatment for you know, people of any age. It's just we're turning on a gene that you made, you, you, that was turned on in you when, you know, when you were a fetus and you haven't, ha you haven't made that protein for 29 years, I would guess. Uh, so, <laughs> and just turn good. it back on, yeah. So can I ask one more follow-up? Absolutely. So how far along are you from the theory to the practice? Everybody always asks that. Uh, and in fact, I told my uh, uh, colleagues here, at some point somebody's going to say, how soon until uh, treatments? Um, I'm surprised it took this long. That's a hard question to answer. Um, so where we're at right now is we've demonstrated in a highly artificial cell line that's set up just right so we can really read out hemoglobins that this works. Um, it's a long jump from that to doing it in true human primary cells, like actual cells taken right out of a person. And then it's an even longer jump to getting permission to doing it in a patient. Um, so, you, you know, you, you sort of do this carefully in cells, in, in just cell lines, working your way up to actual human cells. You check out those human cells very carefully to make sure you're not touching any of the other DNA, you're not doing anything. And then at some point, uh, the, you know, the, uh, 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 the, the FDA has to sit down and look at all the data and say, okay, we think we can go ahead and try this on a patient. Um, and so if I had to guess how long this will take, I would guess, you know, if ten, 10 years to get to the point where, you know, we might be 
thinking about clinical trials would be really good. It took me 16 years to just get from, through the basic stuff. Um, so I'm always real hesitant to guess because you know these are serious life-threatening diseases and people really hinge on uh, hope for, for better treatments. But the, the fact is that um, when you start thinking about things that are therapeutic, the pace slows down because you have to be so, so careful with uh, what you're doing. I would hope. I've, I have no doubt that there will be gene correction, corrective gene therapies that will happen during my lifetime. I just can't tell you if I'm going to be a doddering old man or if I'm still going to have a few marbles up here when it happens. But I, I am sure it's going to happen in my lifetime. Anyone else? Yeah. This is kind of a related question, and, and maybe it's outside the scope, but I think this is fascinating. The well, FDA you. doesn't always share my enthusiasm. Given that you say that nature has already done some of the clinical trials for us in these kinds of therapies, is there a possibility of a more abbreviated clinical trial pathway when you get to that point? Yeah, so the question isn't so much uh, uh, what will happen if we're able to do this particular genetic modification exactly the way we want. I think it's very likely it'll work exactly the way we want. The question is, can we truly do the DNA editing with the level of precision and safety that we need to be able to do? Because the bar is really high, right? I want to I want to like snip out that little bit of code and I want to leave 3.2 billion bases of DNA otherwise utterly untouched. Um, and to prove that you're able to do that is, you know, is going to take some effort. So, but I think it can be done. Yeah. I know it can be done actually. Yes, ma'am. So, will this this won't take away any from the continued research to for treatment. I mean for be, for better treatment. I don't for, think for so. Uh, you know, I I I can't see that because uh, you know, this, this disease it, uh, demands uh, the most efficient possible treatment of symptoms and, you know, to just keep people uh, uh, as healthy as possible and to give them as high a quality and as long a life as possible. So, um, no, I don't, I don't think so. I think it's more sort of uh, uh, an incredibly exciting area of investigation that if it pans out the way we hope, um, will not only, you know, hopefully someday save lives and improve lives, but also greatly reduce uh, the cost of certain types of just medical areas of treatment. Um, gene, again, genetic diseases are disproportionately incredibly expensive uh, just in general. Um, to give you some rough numbers, uh, if somebody has hemophilia A, uh, the typical cost per year of treating them is on the order of $150,000, $200,000 a year. Because they have regular bleeding episodes, they have to go to the hospital and they have to get injections of factor VIII. Um, People who have sickle cell, they have sickling crises. Again, they have to go get blood transfusions and it requires hospitalization. And almost every genetic disorder is like that. They're very expensive because of the really, you know, serious medical ramifications and treatments that are required over and over and over and over again yeah, for a person. I have a grandson that life. has been diagnosed. He has dual genetic diseases. He has sickle cell disease as well as isolaveric acidemia. If you know what that is, PKU, similar to PKU. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, so I know the expense, so yes. But, I mean, we just keep hoping for better treatments, too. And, I mean, it's so exciting to hear this, but then again, you still want the treatments to continue to get better because they are. I, mean, I agree. Yeah. I completely agree. So. Yep. Anyway. Anyone else? Yes, sir. So, you know, one way to treat someone who has a, what we call a hematopoietic disorder, a mutation affecting the bloodstream, is to do a traditional bone marrow transplant or hematopoietic stem cell transplant from a donor who has, you know, the correct gene and you could, in theory, correct the disease. And in fact, in some cases where people have been treated for leukemias or lymphomas with that sort of a transplant, they've had genetic disease is sort of cured as a fringe benefit as a result of the transplant. But in practical terms, uh, um, bone marrow and stem cell transplants are very, very risky and dangerous uh, uh, procedures when you do them with uh, unrelated donors or, or mismatched donors, graft versus host disease. And um, so 
it probably would never be done that way. So this would be a scenario where you would do an autologous stem cell transplant, take cells from a patient, treat them, put them back into the patient. But you're exactly correct that, in theory, using a donor to give you a new hematopoietic system could treat the disease as well. I have a question up here. Sorry, I lost. Where? Sorry. I'm up here. Hi. There you are. Hi. Yeah, so um, for adults that are continuing to produce this um, embryonic uh, hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin. Huh? Fetal, sorry. Yep. Um, what happens to them when they have to maybe have a, an operation or something traumatic where they need a blood transfusion or something like that? Um, they, mean, they do fine um, because typically what happens when you get a transfusion um, is you just have a donor's red blood cells, platelets, whatever, that basically uh, uh, function in your bloodstream. But over time, uh, your, own cell, your own bloodstream will just, you know, take back over. So, um, um, yeah, as long as, you know, they're given a transfusion with the appropriate blood type. It's just like any other transfusion. Okay, so th they don't need to have a, a transfusion that has the fetal? No, no, not at all. Like yeah. Okay, interesting. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, is that what they were doing basically with the stem cell transfer? He had leukemia. That is a great question. So what this gentleman is referring to is a very famous person called the Berlin patient who had, he had really a genetic disease. He, had, he was HIV positive. He'd been on HIV drugs for many years, and he was on those drugs because cells in his hematopoietic system had the HIV genome inserted into them, okay? And so this individual had contracted leukemia, got a transplant, and happened to get a transplant from someone who was naturally resistant, genetically resistant to the virus. And he was cured of his leukemia and also was completely cured of his HIV, basically through something very similar to what I've just described. So that's an example of uh, sort of getting a, a, a serious fringe benefit of a, of a, of a bone marrow transplant. But, so the idea is exactly the same. The, you know, you got a transplant containing hematopoietic cells with a DNA alteration that made him resistant to that disease. We heard him talk here at Yale University. When he, uh, it's an extraordinary story. Right. Yeah. And he did say it was a very, very tough procedure. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, you don't want a bone marrow transplant if you don't have to have one, yeah. for sure. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, it's a recessive disease, meaning that if you have only one mutated gene, you're just a carrier. Um, you need mutated genes from both your mom and your dad. There are certain types of genetic diseases that instead of being recessive, they are what are called dominant instead, which means if you get a mutated copy from either parent, just one, you get the disease. Um, not surprisingly, those are very rare because that means anybody who's, you know, that would mean that your mom or your dad themselves would be sick already, so, but. Is it too far-fetched to think of gene, uh, gene counseling, genetic counseling, to eliminate some of these? So that is a really interesting point, and I had uh, uh, mentioned this uh, to another question, and I'll mention it again. Um, you know. The whole alter, uh, uh, sort of like side-by-side -side area of research to gene correction and gene therapy is exactly what you're sort of thinking about gene counseling. And again, there are like 400 genetic diseases caused by mutations in single genes. In those cases, the mutation is known, the gene is known, and the cost of sequencing DNA is becoming so low that in the very near future, it will be possible for people to get those 400 genes, not their entire genome, but just those 400 genes sequenced for hundreds of dollars. Okay, right now you can sequence a, a whole genome for not much more than $1,000. Uh, just the, the genes that are known to cause genetic diseases of these types, a few hundred dollars. Imagine, so it will be theoretically possible very cheaply for everybody to know their trait status, uh, to know if they harbor a mutation that could lead to, you know, 
hemophilia, cystic fibrosis, sickle cell. This is already done, say, in the Jewish population for Tay-Sachs disease. Um, Tay-Sachs used to be very, very common in a large portion of the Jewish population, and it's almost unheard of now because that trait is screened for with a $40 genetic blood test just to see if anybody has that trait. It's just very common in that particular uh, ethnic uh, uh, background. It's going to be possible very cheaply for, if we wanted, for almost anybody in the country to know their status of all 400 of these traits if we felt like doing that. And then, yeah, genetic counseling and just inf information could potentially really change the na uh, just the, 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 la the landscape of genetic disorders. It's a complicated uh, question to think about. It raises all sorts of uh, ethical conundrums, uh, uh, but it's, it's interesting. One last question I've been told. Yes. So sorry. For ninety nine dollars, they got it to where you get all kinds of genetic. Yeah, that's the. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So there are companies that, and and groups that have been sort of playing playing with this very very thing. That's yes, exactly. So so when I'm telling you about this potential, it's not pie in the sky. There, you know, the technology exists. It's just a matter of companies deciding, deciding to give it a whirl and see if they can find enough people who are willing to pay for it. Well, again, thank you very much for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much, oh. Dr. Stoddard. Thank, thank you. you all. I have two quick invitations before you leave. And one is, and I, I'm going to spring this on Dr. Stoddard, but if we could get back together in 10 years, <laughs> and we're going to be cheering you on in, in the meantime, this is so inspiring, keep going. Well, thank you. And um, secondly, if you're able to a attend in two weeks, we are having our second Science for Life, same time, same place, Thursday, 7 to 8.30, Dr. Jerry Radish will be here, a scientific crystal ball using cancer's genetic signature to predict and prevent relapse. So on behalf of all of us here at the Hutch, thank you for making time this evening. Travel safely and good night.